Hi, welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to talk about engraving and filing. Or, or, if you prefer, filing and engraving. Or, to be totally accurate, engraving, filing, engraving and filing some more, and then more engraving, and then even more filing. <clears throat> In this demo, I will show you how to engrave lines and the other dainty stuff that the sandblaster is ill suited to. In addition, I will cover diamond file engraving. It's easiest to think of it this way. The engraving tools work well for fine line work like pencils, pens, small paintbrushes maybe, and the file works well for shading and blending. But hey, there's no rules here. Do what you want, see what happens. Lawyers and politicians have yet to legislate on what's legal and illegal in glass engraving. And I'm guessing they won't get to it for a long while. And yes, this is indeed a 100% homemade production, but I have learned how to edit clips in iMovie. So we're really advanced now. All right. <clears throat> Remember these two from the sandblasting demo. The one on the left is going to make a comeback today. You may recall that in that demo, I said something about sandblasting a third piece with no stencil. And then I actually didn't do it <laughs> in the video, but pretend like I did. Check out these pieces of glass. What I wanna show you are the very slightly cloudy areas like right in there and there. And it's hard to see, but there and there. Um, the thickness of the flash will be different on every piece of glass. Typically, the darker the color, the thicker the flash, although that is not always the case. The flash layer on blues and greens and pinks can be relatively thick and on reds, it can be relatively thin. When you sandblast, therefore, you may wanna go a little further with the blues and the greens than the reds. If the flash layer is thick, you will definitely want to sandblast a little more, hence these clouds. That, that green piece, that is really thick. Um, because hand engraving requires strength and endurance, and you can make it a little less strenuous by sandblasting a little more. Make sure when you're sandblasting without a stencil that you know which side is the flash side. You won't have the stencil to guide you and looking through the sandblaster window will be even harder than usual to tell from the bubbles. So I always mark the glass with the letter R. And why do I use the letter R? Because if you use the letter O, you're still not going to know. But the letter R only has one orientation that is correct. Also, when choosing your glass, be aware that Lambert's often has these striated ridges on the edges of the sheets. If you are going to file the glass, these ridges will leave freaky scars, which maybe you'll like and maybe you won't like, but they will affect the engraving. <clears throat> also, a word about selected glass and color. In working with flash glass, a little bit of color goes a long way. I have noticed in my years of teaching, the beginning stained glass students choose really bright, strong, deep colors. Why? Because they look gorgeous. But what did I just say? A little color goes a long way. Color is a powerful, powerful thing. Bright color is like using a nuclear bomb when often a water pistol will do. All of this is especially true if you're layering and stacking, which I mentioned at least once in this video, but I'm definitely covering it in another video. So remember, there are more colors than these and as lovely as they may seem when the sun is shining through them, imbuing them with a magic and spiritual quality you never thought possible, there are other possibilities. Remember the pale tints and dark shades are your friends as well. All right, that's enough color theory for now. Let's talk tools. Here are two electric engravers, a Fordham flexible shaft. That is the, this on top and that's the handpiece. And this is a Proxon tool. These tools do the same thing. You stick a diamond burr into them and then they, uh, you turn them on and they rotate. The first tool I'm going to talk about is a Fordham flex shaft. Now I have uh, 
shown you a picture of it, so I'm not going to show you the whole tool. This is the, the flexible shaft itself, and this is a number 30 handpiece. Um, what is a flexible shaft good for? Well, when it comes to engraving and filing, all of the engraving tools are good for engraving lines and a lot of fine detail, stuff that the sandblaster can't do unless you're using an extremely delicate detailed stencil. So this is basically a drawing tool. Um, so think of it as a, a pencil that makes lines. The files on the other hand are shaders, they make tones. So this makes lines and this makes tones. Um, the flexible shaft has a lot of terrific advantages. And this is the tool that I highly recommend that you buy if you are really interested in this technique. This is a Fordham Series S flex shaft. Um, it's a real workhorse. One of the biggest advantages of the Fordham flex shaft is that the, it's called a flex shaft because this thing attaches to the motor, which is way up there on a, um, a bracket that screws right into the side of the wall or the light table or whatever. Um, and therefore you are in absolutely no danger of uh, electrocution because the motor is nowhere near the handpiece and the water. Now um, <clears throat> you can get one of these at a jewelry supply um, like uh, Rio Grande, in Philadelphia, Hagstaws has them. And they're a little pricey, but you know what? With a little maintenance, they should last forever. This is my first flex shaft. I have changed the handpiece numerous times. In fact, I have two number 30 handpieces. One's pink. It's a little hard to tell, but it's pink. Um, <clears throat> and um, all the parts that wear out are readily available. One thing to note is that I am left-handed, so I have oriented the uh, instrument to my left. If you are bending the handpiece to like this because it's on the left and you're right-handed, this section will overheat and it will separate out and it will look just like special effects from an alien horror film. You can replace it, but you don't want to replace it. So there's that. Um, <clears throat> a flexible shaft engraving tool usually comes with a foot pedal. And the foot pedal, kind of like the sandblaster foot pedal, uh, turns the thing on and off. However, when it comes to flex shaft engraving, um, I am pretty much going full throttle always. So uh, the foot pedal will adjust the speed to sort of go slower and faster. And Basically, I use the switch that's on the motor to turn it on and off, and I have disabled my foot pedal, which is uh, in a closet back there. So it's up to you if you want to use a foot pedal or not. I find it uh, obnoxious to have to hold my foot down the whole time. All right. <clears throat> so this is the number 30 handpiece. They come with other handpieces. Wait, I'll show you. This is another handpiece that you can get. Um, this is a quick release handpiece. Look, it's still got a bit in it. You know why? Because the quick release requires that you keep a bit in it, but I'm never gonna use this again because I hate it. Um, uh, this handpiece gets hot. If your handpiece is getting hot, what that means is that you need to reset the, the shaft as to where it connects here, which is kind of a pain in the neck. It's not hard, but it's a pain in the neck. <clears throat> and also, I did not like this, um, this thing up here and this thing here and this thing here. It was hard to use. I've gotten very used to using this. <clears throat> um, all right, so the advantage of this handpiece is that it has a collet and you can put any size shaft into this that you want. So I have different kinds of bits over here. These are these weird things that you can get from his glassworks. And these are cut for polishing surfaces. Think of it as like one of those vacuum cleaners you used to see in the school hallways, mm -hmm. right? But it has a really fat shaft. Um, so you can open this and you will see on the handpiece, there is a, a divot here. 
and there are three little holes. And then there's a bunch of teeth, right? So you put your bit into the handpiece, making sure that it's straight up and down. And then you insert this right here and you tighten it like that. Or you loosen it as the case may be. Um, one thing about the, the uh, um, teeth here is that they get worn down. Maybe that's why you have three options to stick the uh, uh, collet key in because they, they get worn down. And when all three uh, sides are worn down, you'll probably need to get a new hand piece. They're not that expensive, but just keep that in mind. This is the tool I recommend that you get. Did I say that already? It will do everything. It is powerful. It is long lasting. It's a great tool. Now, one thing you may notice if you were at school is that it is about as fun as operating a jackhammer. That's because <laughs> Students don't always know what they're doing and the equipment gets worn out. When you have your own private flex shaft, it will be like a uh, very smooth ride. Once, once you get used to it, it's a little bit rough at first. This, it's your, you hold it like a pencil, but it doesn't feel like a pencil. This is the heaviest, fattest pencil I've ever run into in my life. But once you get used to it, it's pretty ergonomic, comparatively speaking. So this is the tool I recommend the most. Another tool I like to use is a Proxon tool. It looks like this and it plugs in. Um, very similar to this. This is a Draper tool, only this one comes with a battery pack. Um, both of these tools I believe are discontinued. You can often find them on eBay, uh, if so, buy one. Uh, they're usually about 20 bucks. Unlike the Ford and Flex shaft, two things. One, the motor is in the handpiece. So when you're using water, which you have to do, you have to be exceedingly careful that this is not getting wet. Only the tip gets wet. So just use a, a little bit of water at a time and no splashing. Um, <clears throat> the hand pieces on both of these tools are extremely light. This is easy to draw with. You know, um, Dremel also makes uh, hand engraving tools like this, only their hand pieces look like, you know, a, a power saw, uh, I mean a drill rather, and they're huge and they're heavy. And, you know, I think the feel of the hand piece is really important because at least in my work, it's based on drawing. Drawing is uh, done with finesse. Those giant bulky tools they are really hard to draw with. These are easy. However, unlike the uh, flex shaft, this rotates at some slower speed and it's not a very powerful tool, not at all. And what I tend to use this for when I use it, I don't use it that often, is to rough up the glass where I'm going to use the hand engraving files. So um, here, this is, it's got a little on off switch. Oh would help if the electrical supply was on. Here, I'll turn off the light. You just go like that. There, see, there's a little switch there. Grindy, grindy, grindy. Um, <clears throat> these are great. I wish, I don't know why they discontinued them. It seems like such a useful tool. Um, and the Draper tool, really good for teaching workshops because of the battery pack. I don't even know if you can electrocute yourself in the battery pack. I am guessing the answer is no. Both tools, the bit slides in and out. You just pull on it. And if it doesn't work, you can do it with the pliers. All right? Ah. There you go. And then if you want to put it back in, you just put it back in. And this one, so you just connect this here to the battery supply and it goes on. These tools break all the time. It's a good thing they're only 20 bucks. <clears throat> um, and that is the Draper and Proxon tool. Finally, we have the Enax, not the Nakanishi Emacs Evolution. Um, this is an expensive tool 
And I can't even remember where I bought it, but it was imported from Japan and it was a few thousand dollars. If you are going to devote your life to uh, stained glass and do a lot of engraving like I am, you really do want to get one of these if you can possibly afford it, because this is very ergonomic. It's extremely powerful. It's more powerful than the flex shaft. It works like an absolute dream. If you wanna make those lines fast, use this. Uh, it also has a quick release handpiece. So basically you just go like this, take the bit out, put another bit in, and then see what I'm doing? This thing here, this turns like so. You can hear it click. Um, this runs at varying speeds, but I typically use it uh, full blast all the time. Uh, there's a little place to rest your hand. It's extremely ergonomic. I highly recommend this tool, but it's hard to find and it's a few thousand dollars, so it's expensive. Again, the motor is in the hand piece, so you have to be extremely careful not to um, uh, um, get it wet. And this is the on off switch. One thing I hate about this tool, there's nothing I hate about this tool, except it sounds like a hive of angry bees coming to get you. And when it doesn't sound like a hive of angry bees, it sounds like an angry dentist. And uh, I could live without that noise. But you know what? It is rotating at some crazy speed, uh, 40,000 or something like that RPM. Uh, it's a great tool, very powerful, highly recommend it. The burrs for these engraving tools come in all sorts of shapes, but 99 out of 100 of them are for sculpting. If what you want to do is draw on flash glass, you will use a ball shaped burr as seen in this image. When you look at the cone shaped ones, you'll want to use them because they look like the tip of a pencil or a pen, but they are not pencil or pen tips and they will go bald on their tiny tips and they don't really make lines like you think they will. Round ball burrs, on the other hand, they will do that. And this image, it's a, obviously not to scale, but this thing I would say is about three quarters of an inch across right here. So these things are small. They come in all sizes of tiny, from the darn near microscopic to about three sixteenths of an inch here. I will hold one up for you to see. This is my fingertip holding up the largest ball burr that I have. All right. Now these things, you can also stick into the Fordham Flex Shaft. They're intended as polishing wheels and they come from his glass works. I have used them on flash glass for various things and you can experiment and have fun with those as well if you are so interested. This handy color chart will tell you what grit your diamond tools are, at least uh, when they are brand new. They do uh, wear out and get softer and less abrasive. For hand engraving, especially when you are unplugged, you really should use 120 grit or 60 grit. All the rest will take the rest of your life. And while I enjoy engraving, when I said I wanted to devote my life to it, I didn't mean every second of my entire life. And now filing tools. My favorite filing tool is this. It doesn't look like much. Um, this is uh, a diamond surface here. Let's see if I can focus that a little better. Uh, it's just a piece of tape that has diamonds studded into it and uh, on a plastic handle. This is a uh, made by 3M and you can get them from places to sell cold working equipment as I believe the original function of these diamond files was to sharpen edges when you're making beads. Anyway, I decided um, in the 90s sometime that I was interested in hand filing the stained glass to make tones because um, I had figured out that diamonds abrade glass whether or not they're plugged into a machine or not. And I was interested in that. So I obtained this diamond file, which is a metal file and it's, uh, it doesn't bend. So it didn't really work very well. And then I discovered these. These do bend, you can see, very flexible. And that means that you can press down on the glass and sort of push this file uh, with some flexibility. And that is absolutely crucial. 
around for the hand motion. So um, this is an, a 120 grit, uh, one quarter inch starlight file by 3M. You can, did I say this already? You can get them from his glassworks. Um, and they also make fatter ones. However, the flatter ones do not have flexibility, which means that all you can do is sort of slide it around the glass. You can't get any finesse. Um, I tried to scrape down the plastic here to make it thinner and more flexible, didn't work. And they make ones that are round shaped. I have yet to figure out anything useful for this. Not that. Um, also the red handle indicates that it is a, um, a less uh, abrasive grit, less abrasive diamond surface. They also make diamond sponges. Here's, here's a couple. This is your 80 grit, which looks really rough. Uh, and these, uh, these are, you, you can bend them and uh, that means that you can go into the glass like that. Sometimes that's really good. Mm. And finally, um, this is a mechanical pencil for architects and it has a little spring loading thing here and you can pop one of your bits for the Ford and Flex shaft into it and you can scratch the glass with that. I have found this works better for paint that's been fired on rather than the flash layer. It doesn't really go through the flash very well, um, but maybe it'll work for you better than me. And that is filing. <clears throat> Did I explain the hand position? Because that's the whole reason I wanted to make this video. So if I did, I don't remember, and I'm gonna show you again. Here's a piece of glass, right? You want your hand on the file like that. You don't wanna hold it like that. You don't wanna hold it like that. You certainly don't wanna hold it like this. Um, you want your finger right towards the tip. Maybe not all the way over it, but right there, not there. That's too far back. This will snap right off. You want it there. And then you wanna hold this on the glass at almost the same angle. That is what I'm doing in these videotapes. And that's important. So when you watch those videotapes, it's really hard to see because I had to put the camera at a different angle so that I could see what I was doing. And therefore it's a little hard to tell, but I am holding this pretty darn flat and I am using a lot of force. So before you develop your um, superhuman Popeye forearms, you might be a little sore if you're doing this all day long. But once you get your Popeye forearms, you will be in ecstasy because you know what? This is fun. <laughs> At least I think it's fun. And I hope you think it's fun too. And another thing that's great about them is um, because they're flexible and they're small, you can cut them down with a um, heavy duty scissors and you can customize the points to be rounded or smaller um, or any shape that you can come up with. <clears throat> Here are more customized files, but as I said, these bigger ones don't flex, so you can't use them very well as shaders. They only really scour the surface. They also make diamond sponges and you can experiment with these as well. And finally, his Glassworks sells offcuts from the process of making these tools. You can buy bags of them for like, I don't know, $20. And you can make your own filing tools by gluing these to handles or gluing them to whatever you want. They, that can be really fun and can really come in handy. Other supplies that you will need for engraving and filing are a squeeze bottle for water and bath towels. When working with diamond tools, you always need water. The water cools the diamond surfaces and makes them work better. If you don't use water, the tool will only last a few hours before the diamonds just fall off or stop working. When you are engraving and filing, and you will notice this in the videos, I am squeezing out a little puddle of water and it gets cloudy pretty fast. Then I mop it up with my towel and I put down fresh water. If you are doing a lot of engraving in one afternoon, for example, you may go through several bath towels because 
If you are using an engraving tool with the motor in the handpiece, such as the Proxon tool or the Emacs Evolution, you need to make sure things don't get soaking wet. So once that towel is wet, you need to switch it for a dry towel. And you need to also make sure that no water is getting into your handpiece and that no water is splashing around or spraying. Be mindful of your light table as well. It is also an electrical appliance. So you don't use much water at all, but it gets dirty very quickly and you need to change it every couple of minutes, absorbing it in that towel and putting down new water. You will see me doing that over and over and over again. Um, <clears throat> so because these techniques do not create spray or dust, or they shouldn't be, um, you should still wear an apron, eye protection, and a dust mask. First, I want to show you some simple engraving things you can do. Remember, engraving with a flex shaft or any type of rotary tool is basically the equivalent of drawing with a pointed pencil or pen, um, or maybe a very tiny paintbrush. It doesn't really feel like a paintbrush such as one might use to paint, so pretend it's a pencil. First off, you can engrave any glass surface, but it is much easier to engrave a sandblasted surface. Sometimes the flash is quite thick and it makes sense to thin it out a bit. Also, you can mark the sandblasted surface with a permanent marker such as a Sharpie and it won't wipe off when it gets wet like uh, the unsandblasted surface of glass, it will wipe right off of that. So it's much more permanent. Here are two examples of demonstrations that I've done in the past, uh, which are done with sandblasting and engraving only, nothing else. On the left, I engraved the spines of the leaves and the berries. The rest, all of the stuff is all sandblasted. On the right, I engraved the dots and these um, lines on the triangles, ignore the yellow for now. And here is a demonstration of simple engraving using the Fordham flip shaft. Thank <laughs> you. 
spontaneous and have fun. Um, <clears throat> you can get a lot of mileage out of sandblasting and engraving in terms of creating design and imagery. It is really potentially an amazing way of uh, making images. <clears throat> Here are some examples by others, mainly former students of mine. You can see the engraving here in the dancers and also in the flame-like border. And uh, please check out Carissa Gregorio's Instagram for more stained glass work. Here, my student Sean McCollum engraved lines in flash glass he had blown himself. Way extra credit for that. And in this piece, the expressive typo that says dog eats, dog eats, dog eats, dog eats, dog was done with an engraving tool as well. As what, uh, and also the text up here and this part, these parts here. Yes, this did used to be a piece of red flash glass. You know, a lot of times students say to me, oh my God, I do not want to sandblast all the red off of this piece of glass. It seems like a lot. Well, don't be afraid to sandblast and engrave a lot of the flash layer off. That's one of the th reasons it's there. <clears throat> and it is quite versatile. <clears throat> Check out this charming meat grinder. I bet you never considered the flash glass was good for drawing meat grinders, did you? Well, it is. And here's another psychedelic veiny head with, uh, I believe that's a, a blunt. I don't know. I'm not hip to what the students and young people are into these days. And now I'm gonna change tack and talk about my work. But this that you're seeing also includes filing, which is why it's so smooth and includes tonal shading. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna talk about filing, but it is more accurately engraving and filing because you can't really engrave without doing, I mean, you, you, can <laughs> you can engrave without doing any filing, but if you want lines, you can't file without engraving. So they're sort of codependent in other words. I have a series of images from my own work here so that you can see what's possible. And first and foremost, I should say that this technique very much depends on your level of drawing skill. I draw a lot and I've drawn for decades. Also, I really love the way blue glass files. So I do a lot of it, but I do, I do have some examples that are not blue. Here you can see the engraving is these rocks and anything that is a sharp edged line. So maybe the uh, outside of this fox here, but the smooth tones were all done with the file. 
I also frequently work with several layers of flash glass, as you can see in the bottom here, cr which creates a lot of color. But I will show that in another demo video, because before I get to layering, I have something that is fully completed that looks like that. Here we see the stages of a red piece of flash glass. This is just sandblasted, and that is the Sharpie pen. And here I am starting to go in with the engraver and the filing tools. And here's a little more and a little more, and yet, but still, a little more. Here's a pinkish violet color. Another thing you may be interested in is combining engraving and filing with vitreous paint. So the, this is a pink color, but the reason it looks brown is that I have covered this piece of glass with some brown paint so that I'm actually filing through the brown and the pink to make this image be multicolored. And I will show that in another video. And this is what that piece looked like when it was all done. And just for reference, I would say something like this probably took about a week, um, maybe a total of 25 to 40 hours. Um, I, when I do the demo, I do it all in one sitting, which is kind of crazy. Here is a light blue piece, which I combined with vitreous paint. So you can see the various stages. And when you see the black, that's when I'm adding the glass paint. If you're interested in exploring this technique, I really suggest that you start with simple images such as platonic solids or chess pieces. We all love the Queen's Gambit, right? So uh, draw some chess pieces for a while. And now I'll demonstrate the chess piece. So the first thing I'm doing is putting water down on the glass. I don't know, about three tablespoons full. And this is the Fordham Flex shaft I'm using. And I'm going to start by creating the hard edge lines around the outside of the top of the chest piece. It takes a little while to get used to the motion of a flex shaft engraver or any engraver. So uh, test it out first. It's a little rough. Some are rougher than others. And you will definitely have to go over lines several times to get a clean, straight line. Um, I would say uh, the, the Fordham Flex Shaft line, all natural, has a sort of lumpy look to it, which looks a lot to me like the Fordham Flex Shaft talking and not the artist. So I am careful to make it my own. So as I'm engraving, I'm also sort of going around making swirly shapes and, and roughing up the surface a little bit because those are the areas I'm gonna file. You can file all the way down from the full thickness that's there, but that takes a while. And if I know I want it to be really light, you might as well just start with the engraving tool. So I'm doing the highlights, the lines, and roughing it up a little bit. Every couple of minutes, I am sopping up the dirty water and I am replacing it with clean. It's a little hard to see that the water gets dirty, but you will see it when it gets cloudy. That's when you should change it, even a little bit cloudy. The cloudiness is diamond slurry. I mean, not diamond slurry, I'm sorry. It's glass slurry. And the glass slurry creates a barrier between the diamond surface and the um, glass so that you're less effective using your tool. Also, without the water, you will have, um, the tool will last, oh, I don't know, an hour or so before it will go bald. So the water is very necessary for all diamond tools. And there I am cleaning up the water again. This is the file, all right. Notice where my finger is. What you can't see is that I'm actually applying quite a bit of force to this. And I'm going around in little circular motions. This is a spherical shape I'm trying to make. <clears throat> Wiping off the dirty water. This too is a diamond tool. And then going back into the top to create, um, I don't know, a specular reflection. What's that thing called? Something like that. So 
this is the part I think is really fun. I could do this, I don't know, forever. Um, to me, it's like watching shapes emerge. I know, uh, I don't wanna compare myself to Michelangelo, but with the way he said that you would see the figure emerging from the block of marble, I am seeing the chess piece emerge from the flash glass and it feels like magical. Another thing I wanna call your attention to is the angle at which I am holding this file. I know that's earlier in the demo, but I can't stress it enough. I'm holding it almost flat to the surface of glass. There is maybe room for my knuckles. They're not actually dragging on the floor, but they are close to it and I'm proud of it. I always go back and forth between engraving and filing thousands of times. I don't know if this seems slow or fast to you, but I will say this. One thing about subtractive techniques like carving into glass, engraving glass, carving into stone, any kind of carving um, is that it is not for the faint of heart. Once you have removed that material, it's gone forever. So don't be afraid to go slow. I don't, I don't know if that, does this seem slow or fast to you? It seems kind of in between to me, but um, go as slow as you need to so that you can see what you are doing. But don't be afraid because you know what? I personally screw up tons of this stuff. If you can work with scraps, that's the best. I will tell you, any artist who works with flash glass makes scraps. Maybe they want to give them to you because I will I might want to give them to you. Um, I have piles of this stuff. Don't call and ask. I give them to students. The students get the scraps to practice on and they're great to practice on. Um, so practice first. And the whole while this is going on, it's quite loud. You can't be on your telephone. You can't even really listen to the radio. You can listen to headphones. You, uh, I know I said in the glass cutting demo, you cannot listen to headphones because you need the input from your ears. You actually do not need this input from the engraving tool. It's just obnoxious. So if you are by yourself, wear headphones. Do not wear headphones in a shop. You need to stay alert in a shop to other people. Cleaning up that water. Sometimes I have to clean up the surface of the light table as well. The glass starts to stick to the light table from capillary action. I'm just pulling it up across the surface a little bit there, following the form. So if the form is a cylinder, I'm imagining that I am caressing a cylinder with that file. I know that sounds silly, but it's not a joke. I really am. That's even more important with faces. When I'm doing faces, I feel like I'm touching faces.
You'll notice there's some bubbles in the glass. All flash glass has bubbles, or most of it does. That is not considered a defect. I know with glass blowers, they, they really try hard to have no bubbles, but bubbles in flash glass are considered character. They are desirable. We like bubbles. It doesn't bother me that it's there. It's just part of the character of the glass. Bet you're thinking, when is she going to stop already? It looks like a chess piece. Well, you know, I told you I liked doing this. <laughs> and there's more. There's a bonus. There's a secret bonus track. You won't want to miss it. So how close am I to working off the drawing? The answer is it's not very close, actually. I should have mentioned this at the outset. Um, I'm actually looking at the drawing and sort of free, free handing it. Um, it's the negative of a chess piece, but I happen to know from years and years of experience that by putting a negative on to, onto this, it's going to look like a positive. So there's no real difference. Um, in terms of what the eye is perceiving in the, in the glass. But I, um, I showed the sketch and I showed the positive and the negative and for what it's worth, I am looking at the negative and I am sort of freehanding it. All right, am I really not done? I really thought I was done there. Have I mentioned how much I love this? <laughs>
Okay, now I'm done. <clears throat> Sorry about the upside downness. There is literally no way to record video with it being right side up because there's no place to put that camera at all. And I am the cameraman and the editor. And all of this I have learned this week, thanks to COVID and the imperative to teach remotely. I always wanted to do this, but I am telling you, I wasn't planning on learning it anytime soon. <laughs> For those of you who are interested in figurative art, I do recommend watching the eyeball. I think the eyeball came out a little better than the chess piece. And I'm gonna do a time check here. It's only eight minutes long. The other was 14. You'll notice there's a bubble in the bag under the eye where um, the glass has the, a slight defect, but we like them. Roughing up the surface again for filing, cleaning off that filthy water, fresh water, and now we start to file right away because why wait? Filing is my favorite. I believe I've mentioned that now at least 10 times. Changed my mind about that pupil. Remember, when you're rendering curving undulated forms, imagine your hands going around them in real life. I'm not kidding, it helps. This is the Proxon tool, the one that isn't very powerful, but it roughs up the surface so that the um, more the flash is gone, makes it easier to file.
Now I'm really pressing down and I'm using more the middle of the file there. Am I gonna keep going? No, I'm gonna rough it up. That was a little too much for me. I'm gonna rough it up first instead. Really messy. It's okay, because I'm gonna blend it in with my blendy filer. And the whole time I'm thinking about eyebrows and the shape of the human forehead and the shape of the orbital hole for your eyeball. I used to know the real name. You know, I wasn't gonna do this eyeball, but that piece of glass, the chess piece was on, had that empty vacant space begging for art or whatever. I don't know what happened there. Oh, I'm picking a different file because I want a really small tip for that eye because it's not a big space. Maybe uh, about less than three quarters of an inch. So that's a file that I've chopped the tip down. He thought I was done. Not done. You need to have those uh, eye lines around your eyes. What's that? Your iris. And a little highlights to make a to make it look wet. I wasn't too happy with that last white line I put under the eye, but there it is forever. It's not a big deal. And there we go. Eyeball and chess piece. And here's the piece finished. Now the bubbles that were in the piece, they don't bother me at all, um, but I will just say that uh, um, the, uh, it looks like a teardrop. I think that's pretty cool. So there you go.
couple of last words. I started filing in 1995. And as far as I know, I invented this application of diamond filing into flash glass. I am really eager and happy to share it with people because I really, really love doing it. And I think others will too. But I want people to know that I invented it. Maybe that's egotistical, but I have to be honest. You don't have to give me credit. That's not what I'm saying here, but I don't want you to take credit either. This has been a public service announcement from my ego. <clears throat> now I know that the red glass demo with the chess piece was a little lengthy. I'm going to make a much longer, more in-depth video of a complete face. If you're interested in learning more about this um, technique in depth, the video will be called Blue Head. So uh, look for it and bon appetit. <laughs>